I'd like to say thank you all for coming out tonight to the Queen Anne's County Watermen's Association's Waterman's Story Swap. We're going to start this evening with a little music. Harry Davidson is a Kent Islander, a waterman, an environmental activist. His music captures the essence of his love of the bay and the lives of watermen, and the songs on his CD, Songs of the Chesapeake Bay, tells the waterman's story through that music. He'll be accompanied this evening by Shay Springer, who downplays his role in Harry's work, but Shay is obviously a talented musician, very soulful, and I know how much Harry appreciates him. Shay is the owner-operator of Sweetfoot Recording Studios located in Easton, where he's recorded and played with a number of artists across many genres. Please give a round of applause to Harry and Shay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this first song is uh, uh, Roberta Ball Thompson. <laughs> Now he's from Kenaya and he's tired of not or two. He worked the water all his life, that's all he ever knew. Butterball, butterball, the anchor throwing man. Now one day his engine quit and he was running out of time. He had to get back close to shore before the next ebb tide. He threw that anchor high, threw that anchor long. It seemed like it touched the sky, but that anchor it held strong. And when he got back to shore, he held that anchor prone. A symbol of a waterman, he made it on his own. And when they had the festival and the anchor toss contest, no one could touch Butterball, he is the waterman's best. Through that anchor high, through that anchor long, like it touched the sky, but that anchor it held strong. Thank you. <laughs> this next song is uh, just for a general waterman. It's called I'm a Waterman. I work on the sea. Made a man out of me, nothing wrong with the land. But I'm a water man. Some days for sure, a mighty hard to work from sun to sun. At the end of the day, bow my head and say, Thank God I'm a water man. Say a bad day on the water beach, a good day on land, and I'm telling you, man, I understand. Cause I'm a water man When I put out to sea I leave my troubles ashore And I ain't about To come back for more But there is one thing And that's for sure I'm a water man So I'm telling you mate And I'm telling you now Ain't no use to try To keep me on land Cause I'm a Chesapeake Bay Water man Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you, Thank you, guys. We really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to mention that Harry's granddaughter is here tonight with us, Jess Jacqueline. Uh, she's working on an ongoing movie documentary called Waterman. It's about her grandpa, his music, and his environmental activism. Waterman has won a number of awards including <laughs> Waterman has not won a number of awards, including the best documentary short film at last year's Chesapeake Film Festival. And Maryland Public Television will be showing that film this coming week on Saturday. Uh, let's see, it'll first premiere on Wednesday, April 25th at 9 p.m. 
and then one repeat on Saturday the 28th at 8.30, and it'll be part of the Storyline series. Um, so look for Storyline on MPT on Wednesday, April 25th, and Saturday, April 28th. Also, uh, if you want to check out watermanfilm.com, it's an opportunity to help Jess uh, realize her goal of making this into a full-length documentary. Um, what I'd like to do now is just kind of give you an idea of what's going to happen tonight. Uh, first, we're going to have a little introduction by a guest speaker. We're going to do our Waterman's panel story swap. Then we're going to have a little question and answer period with a, a bit of a twist. At the end, we're going to try to save an hour or so at the end so that you folks can mingle and socialize a little bit, look at some of the displays, perhaps buy some books, and maybe even get a drink. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, George O'Donnell comes from a long line of watermen. He grew up right here on Winchester Creek, not a mile away. Uh, George worked on the water for over 20 years. He served as, George, as a judge of the Orphans Court for Queen Anne's County, uh, twice as county commissioner. He was the founder of the Queen Anne's County Watermen's Festival and oversaw the Maryland Watermen's Monument at Kent Narrows. George is currently the Fisheries and Boating Customers Relations Manager for Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Please welcome George O'Donnell. Thank you, Brent. I didn't know how uh, famous Butterball was, and now he's got a song. <laughs> got a, got a song, song about him. How about that? Well, well deserved. And. For those of you that don't know, when we had the we hosted the Waterman's Festival in Kenton Harris for ten years, then our venue sort of got built out with restaurants and um, and uh, hotels and so forth. So um, those ten years, uh, we had the anchor throwing contest, and uh, Butterball won it each and every year. So he's the retired champion uh, for an anchor throwing. So yeah, he. Uh, a lot of people came just to, just to see him do that. Uh, just to digress a little bit, I I grew up on Winchester Creek, just just behind the VFW here, and um, in 1963, I started soft crabbing, and I was six years old, and uh, my mother would take take me down to to the Narrows, and most of the soft crabs I caught were sold in Mr. Schultz's restaurant, so I deserve a little credit for the great success he's enjoyed over, over all, all these years. You know what I'm saying? Don't you forget it. I said, I got his back, you know. <laughs> Some of them were hard crazy. So. How about that? But I could only get him to pay me $3 a dozen by the time they crawled across the parking lot from Alex in the back there. But And my first boat, ironically, I've been intertwined with the VFW for a long time. My first boat I bought out of the parking lot here. The deal wasn't made here. The boat was here. And it came here from, uh, they used to have seafood festivals here years ago. And it, the boat was left and, and there was a 19 foot dead rise with a little Erica engine. And I was 12 years old and I started using that in and around school. And that's, that's what I, what I used the whole, whole time until I got, got out of school. And, um, in 1975, I bought, I was, just getting out of school, I bought a, a tuck stern out of, uh, it was a Kent Island stern boat, particularly good for trot line craving, and um, kept that boat for good, a good while. And in 1977, I, uh, I bought my, my big work boat so I could go clamming, doing some other things, eeling and, and oyster diving and so forth. So, and then, so I got my equipment together and I, um, uh, then the winter of 77 came. And that was a that was a very very that was the worst winter of my lifetime and of many lifetimes I suspect. The temperature didn't get above freezing for over two months. Bill Legg and I I don't know if Bill's here tonight, but Bill Legg and I were were hand tonging together Crab Alley. And the last day we worked was New Year's Eve until February seventeenth. Um, the bay was completely frozen. The Kent Irish Channel was open for oystering. For the first time in years, and when, it, when it's cold, the bacteria rate goes down. Health department will let you oyster there. We'd been getting six dollars a bushel for oysters, and at that time they raised them to ten. 
even Jerry Harris was paying ten dollars. I mean, you couldn't, you could, you couldn't hardly. Believe. We didn't even have to go on strike for that. So anyway, so anyway, we uh, we we got ten dollars for oysters, and the first day we worked, uh, the seventeenth, I believe, it was was seven degrees. Two days later, it was, it had warmed up to ten, and the water temperature is about twenty-seven degrees. And the way I know is because I fell overboard uh, <laughs> in the Catanaris Channel. And Bill and I, our boat was, was frozen in Little Creek, and we got in with Norman Darrell. He had his boat at the Catanaris, and we worked with him. <clears throat> and when I, I remember looking at my hat on the surface of the water uh, above my, when I came, came to the top, and all I remember is Norman said, give me your hand, and I was never so glad, never so glad to see him. So that just gives you a feel for some of the, the difficult times that you have to work, work through on the water. That was, that was a... Uh, very, very trying time in the winter, and a lot of people had a tough time because we didn't work for six weeks. Down, you could go down Crab Alley Bay, it looked like Lake Placid with all the ice boats. <clears throat> Ted Lee, Jackie Ringle, and everybody had these homemade ice boats. They sailed, were sailing them like sailboats all over Crab Alley Bay. One guy got a, uh, had a, an old wreck car they probably got from Murrow, I imagine, and they drove it all over Eastern Bay. They, they go out there and get it up to 70 or 80 miles an hour and spin the wheel around and it would do this and it'd take a couple miles for it to stop sliding. But uh, so that, that you could drive a car from here to Crisfield on the ice. It was, a, it was really a, a bleak winter. I wanted to mention uh, something also about many times what we've had to do to maintain our rights uh, working on the water. In 1981, a bill passed uh, General Assembly that regulated oyster diving. One of the things that I, I did in earlier life, I was president of the Maryland Divers Association. And the bill did several things, but one of the things it did was require people that dove for oysters to catch an inch larger oyster than anybody else ever had. In 1927, the three-inch call sign was, was put in place, and everybody abided by that. Then this, this law changed that. So um, the problem with that was it was done to put people out of business that were diving because they weren't the constituents of, of a senator south of here. And we really, had a, we really had a time with that because MSX and Dermo, the oyster disease, had killed most of the bigger oysters. So that put us in a position where we were forced to break the law as it was written every day. And until we had a chance to get to court and make a case uh, that this, this law just wasn't, wasn't right. <clears throat> so what we had to do, we were kept to keep the three to four inch oysters we always had, we had to hide them all over the boat and do all these things, you know, to try to, to, try to get by and then to get them, get them to sail. The NRP would come and search our boats occasionally because they, somebody would say, hey, these people are catching small oysters and so forth. Meanwhile, they were the same size everybody else was allowed to catch. So um, we were getting real weary about people coming searching their boats. When they come and you, you, you were getting really tired of this and they'd come and say, well, you know, we got we to gotta look around, we got to report you have something in the cabin. I said, well, uh, so you'd ask for a search warrant and then they'd go through the probable cause thing. And um, they, they would approach my cabin, they'd look through the window and um, it, before they would go in and I had a curtain over the front of my, the forward part of my cabin. And he said, what, uh, so what's behind the curtain? I said, that's where my pit, pit bull stays uh, while, I'm, while I'm working. And I just, because we were getting so irritated with these people. So he said, well, it's against the law to have a dog on a shellfish boat. <laughs> I, said, I, I, said, uh, uh, I said, well, I, all I can tell you is he's sleeping up there and he probably wouldn't appreciate you waking him up, so I'll let you take it up with him. And he, uh, so anyway, so they said, well, we got to go up here. So I walked up by the door and he walked up the front of my cabin and the guy uh, sort of set him up a little bit, and he, he started to pull the curtain back. When he did, I went, rrr, rrr, rrr. <laughs> <laughs> and the law, law officer jumped. I, I, said, uh, I said, my goodness gracious, I said, uh, you, didn't, um, you didn't really think I had a dog up there, did you? He said, I don't, I don't know. He said, dealing with you, you're pretty crazy. I, I, I didn't put it past you. So he said, uh, uh, I so he, he didn't find up, you know, what he said was up there and, you know, as far as other oysters and all. But what, we, what came out of that was all that wrangling 
was eight of us challenged that law in Centerville District Court, and we had to dismiss it as unconstitutional, and that was, uh, that was a really good thing. It's hard to believe that legislature could pass something like that, but if Forrest Gump went over the legislature, he'd say it was like a box of chocolates. You just don't know what you're going to get over there, because there's five and a half million people living in the state of Maryland, and five of them don't live on the Eastern Shore. So that you have to try to educate them and go through this process, and these guys, Troy and Bob, and all of them go over there all the time. And God bless them. It takes a strong constitution. In 2003, the Maryland Waterman's Monument was established Kenton Hours after seven years of planning and fundraising. Uh, the monument serves as an everlasting reminder of the contributions Waterman have made to our communities. And uh, just the, before I forget, Anyone who's, occasionally someone asks us about how do you get your name on the monument or the, or the, uh, the granite sides. There are forms back there by the door, uh, anyone that's interested. Um, just a quick snapshot on, on our fisheries, because I do work at, I've sort of closed the loop in my life from being on the harvesting side of things to now being on the regulatory side in the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. I left the Bay for politics in 1990, where as Brent said, I served as commissioner and orphan score judge, but uh, currently with the, uh, it's a really interesting job I have because uh, I can talk to anybody fishing on the bay from three miles off the coast. We'll be down the Ocean Forum next week on Friday talking to ocean fishermen about spiny dogfish and conch and all those things and, and clear to the Conowingo Dam. So it's, it's, it's really been an interesting thing that the bit I knew about this area and everything else, and there's a whole lot more of everything else out there. So uh, it's 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 really been a, a fun opportunity to go over there and, and work with people I used to fuss at all the time. Um, and also, I brought up some copies of this uh, our, our latest uh, crab and fishing guide. And there's a box of those back by the door as well. Anything, this is a recreational book primarily, but it tells you anything you need to know about crabs and, uh, and, and, uh, and fish, uh, fishing in Maryland or recreationally, any, anything you want to do with that. And then, uh, of course, uh, just a snapshot on how the bay is doing. There's good news. Uh, soft shell clams have made a great return in, the, in the, this section of the bay uh, the last several years. And at the same time, bay grasses have... Uh, increased tremendously. That's the lungs of the bay. Dead zones and oxic waters have shrunk. Another positive sign increased water quality and the process <clears throat> and um, progress is, is still being made through the Chesapeake Bay program. You probably saw where the governor funded four million dollars for the uh, Conowingo Dam project to try to straighten out all the pollution that's running downstream from there, nutrient and, and sediment pollution. Uh, striped bass, another great young of the year index uh, year. We're expecting a, a strong performance for striped bass, and the fishermen should be glad to hear that. Governor Hogan put $750,000 into oyster res restoration projects. That th Those projects are moving, uh, uh, fully moving ahead. And <clears throat> the last full season, we harvested 224,000 bushel of oysters, and uh, in the public fishery, 70,000 with aquaculture. The... Uh, Winter uh, dredge survey for crabs uh, uh, is, has been concluded, but all the numbers have not, have not been crunched yet. And currently I'm working on a, a training program for the department. It's called Work to Live Well, where I'll be working with a group of participants interested in working on the water in a crew sense. Um, so uh, with that, I, uh, I'll, I'll be turning it over to this, uh, this all-star cast here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so happy that we were able to come out. All right, so this is our panel tonight. Uh, if you do me a favor and hold your applause until I introduce everybody, and then we're going to start our storytelling session. <laughs> For the last 50 years or so, Sonny Schultz, along with his late wife Betty and their three sons, has owned and operated Fisherman's Inn, a Kent Narrows landmark since 1930. Sonny has served as Queen Anne's County Commissioner. He's been a leader in regional economic development 
and has supported too many philanthropic projects and causes to count. But before all that, Sonny had been working on the water since he was 12 years old. Charles Bryan was born on Marshy Creek right here in Graysonville in 1932. Charles has been working on the water since he was a kid. He's seen and done and caught it all. He's oystered and crabbed, eeled and fished nets, caught muskrat, worked on oyster propagation for the state of Maryland, and ran fishing parties for 40 years. Charles has participated in every one of our story swaps, so Charles is our good luck charm. Both sides of Eddie Grimes' Eastern Shore family worked the water, and Eddie has followed his family tradition his whole life. Though he's always loved clamming most, from the C&D Canal down to the Virginia line, Eddie has labored at whatever it took to make a buck. Eddie has de dedicated his life to working on the water, and he tells me that he can't imagine having done anything more fulfilling with his life than that. Joey Sadler is a fifth generation waterman, at least. At eight years old, he worked fishing parties for his dad for $5 a day and called oysters for a dollar. Joey bought his first boat when he was 12 years old. He feels privileged to have learned alongside his dad and his grandfathers, and he says that one of the essentials for working on the water, one of the essentials for success when working on the water, is having an understanding spouse. <laughs> Joey is the owner and captain of Captain Pride Charters. Next, we have Calvert Butterball Thompson. He's a big guy with a big heart. And he's always been there for his fellow watermen, as well as this community at large. Butterball comes from a family of watermen, boat builders, and marina operators. He's well known for his strength and his work ethic. And as George mentioned, he's famous as a champion competitive anchor thrower. Next, we have Captain Warren Butler. Warren started his career as a waterman after serving in the Army during the Korean War. A lifelong resident of Graysonville, Warren remembers as a little boy when the crabbers used to unload um, and put their, catch, their daily catch on the trains to go to Love Point and be carried uh, off the eastern shore on the steamboats. Um, primarily an oysterman and a fishing party captain, uh, Warren also worked for 10 years as a patrol boat captain at Aberdeen Proving Grounds. Rob Newberry grew up on the water. He's been up and down and all over the Chesapeake Bay. He's a graduate of the Chapman School of Seamanship with a master's upgrade on his captain's license. He's oystered, he's clammed, and he's crabbed in his career. And today, Rob is a charter fishing and hunting guide. Rob is the chairman of the board of the Delmarva Fisheries Association and the captain of Jim Dandy Charters. And finally, down there on the end, I have my buddy Clarence Graham. When Clarence was a little boy, his family worked on a Kent Island farm owned by Harry and Janet Breeding. And when Clarence's family moved to Dominion, Miss Janet convinced Clarence's reluctant but agreeable mom to let him stay on the farm, which he did until the Breedings passed away years later. Clarence treasures his memories of those early days. Uh, he learned to oyster from his brother, and he hand tongs for about 20 years. In the 1980s, he started driving a crab truck for George Hill and found a job that he loves and he still performs today for Clark Seafood in Chestertown. Can I get a round of applause for our guys? So there are two things that are certain. Watermen are an important part of our history and our cultural heritage, and they face a lot of challenges. One of the most dramatic of the challenges that they face can be Mother Nature. And as in a story that Sonny told me a while back, another one of those challenges can be the people that you work with. Uh, Sonny told me that he quit oystering for Paul Coleman and Jesse Jobes and went with Teeny Jones and Robert Horney partially because they had a stove. <laughs> So, Sonny, will you tell us a story about when you started working for Teeny and Robert and fell overboard? We were down, sir. We were down east in Florida. We were down eastern bay, tonging, and it was the sun was getting going down. You know, we 
that time you work long days when you could. So we were working in deep water. And I started mopping the boat up, getting the mud off of her and all. And I slipped and fell overboard. I only had a pair of gum boots on to the hips. Two pair of pants, about three pair of socks, and I don't know what all. Washed my hat off my head, and I had the ear pops down. <laughs> so when I come up, I was on the side of the boat, and Tina and Robert were laughing so damn hard that they didn't help me get in. <laughs> but we had so many horses in the boat, the boat was low-sided, so I, I climbed back in and dumped my boots out. I couldn't get my damn feet over the washboard to <laughs> dump the water out. But anyway... Then with no clothes, but Teeny had an old World War I Army overcoat and an old heavy wool thing. God damn it, scratch, itch. <laughs> but I put it on and took everything off but my boots, wrung my socks out and put them back on because you didn't want to rub your feet in, the, in them damn gum boots. So I got so close to the stove, I didn't know I burnt myself till I got home <laughs> and warmed up. I wouldn't even let them in the cabin. We were down the Eastern Bay with a place called Centerfield, working long togs. So it was, let me tell you something, that's, that's a great life. I worked on the water until I was 1970 when I built the first restaurant, the one that burned. I run charter fishing from 57 to 70. I started out fishing, six people, $50 a day. So if you think it was something, it was something. But we didn't have the fish then that we have now. We had a legal limit of 11 inches for a rockfish. So, you know what we did? We, we used to keep them. <laughs> so, but anyway, I'm done telling my story. There, Joe. <laughs> so, George mentioned that winter of 76, 77 that was so bad and everything was froze up for so long. And um, Charles has a story about his son Charlie falling overboard that winter and never getting wet. Uh, can you tell him about that, Charles? Well, the boys were home from, sc from school. It was on a Saturday, I think. And every, everything was froze up except the Kenton Irish. It was blocks of ice coming through there. That when Charlie fell overboard, he fell on the block of ice. And he was, he was floating down the river. He never got wet. Never got wet at all. I think his foot got a little wet. But he, the boat's behind us, and Barry Coleman was pretty close. He picked him up and, and brought him back up to us. And Charlie got back up back in the cabin. Because I always kept a lot of extra clothes in the cabin. And he changed his clothes and went back to work. That's right. <laughs> so, um, Eddie, uh, you told me a story about, um, I'm going to ask you a couple things, actually, but a little quick story you told me about that winter. Uh, you were working down Second Kent, and you heard somebody, was it Brother Kyer? You got it. What do you tell? <laughs> we were down there working in a hole. United Shellfish called and said, you bring me a hundred bushel. He said, I got more money for mine. We got fifteen dollars for our oysters that year. We were making so much. We were making so much money. We didn't know what to do with all. Barbara Mandel had us on had us on unemployment and all kinds of good shit. I never <laughs> seen so much money. <laughs> yeah, it was. Oh, Barbara, look it out for us. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> Old brother Kyer, he had it. Graving the lawnmower coming across there. And you can hear everybody pop, 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 pop. And all of a sudden, boop, 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 boop. That was all that. <laughs> Eddie, you also, you also told me a story uh, in regards to a different weather issue that uh, ended up with a 55-gallon drum. Yeah, that was the time I come back from Deals Island. We were down off James's. Got caught in a thunderstorm going about 70. I had a 55 gallon drum of water sitting on the other side of that clam rig for balance. I told my uncle, I said, I ought to tie that thing down. He said, When you turn that over, it's going to be doing something. Well, it was doing something. 
because when I rolled it, when it rolled over, it went right straight through my dunnage and hit the Kilson thing. God, that stopped it. And I told Abby, I said, I don't know where you're going, but I'm going James's, and I'm going to run this on the ground and get off. <laughs> and he was hollering, no, you ain't got to do that. We'll, we'll make it. We'll make it. So the thunderstorm finally eased up. I got to Tillman's Island. I got Garland Phillips' house. I tied her up. I said, I'm done. I ain't going home. This is it. <laughs> he said, man, this fell out late night. I said, N you kid, I ain't. <laughs> I got to kiss the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eddie. Um, and Joey, you had a story uh, about a lightning strike. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows how quick the thunderstorms roll up on you in the summertime on the bay. So we had caught our lemon and rockfish, and we were making our way back towards Kentmore Marina on the bay front there. One uh, hot, hazy afternoon in the summertime. Uh, we looked to the south, and it looked like it does outside here now with the sun shining. But we looked to the north, and there was one little black cloud of lightning up near the bridge, thunder and lightning. Uh, we got in front of Kentmore Marina. Just started sprinkling a little bit. You know, I had my side curtains rolled up, and I had my nephew, Jim, on the boat mating for me. And he was a Marine. He did two tours of Iraq. But he reached up to undo one of the side curtains, and the lightning struck my antenna right above his head. <laughs> he jumped from one side of the boat to the other and looked at me. He goes, Uncle Joe, said they've shot at me. They tried to blow me up with IEDs. He's as close as I come to dying right here on the bay. <laughs> but, but when that lightning struck the boat, it come in the cabin, and all I seen was a real light, real quick flash of light right in my face. And then I just started smelling smoke where it burned out all my electronics. Uh, uh, I hurried up and got, I had a charter on the boat. We got into the marina, and I got them off and started looking for far or anything underneath deck, but it just, it just brought all my electronics. But. Luckily, nobody got struck, and you know, the electronics could be repaired. So, lucky on that side of it. But being struck by lightning is no fun. Trust me. And then Butterball, you you told us you told us a story about um, going down to St. Michael's and boat racing with your dad and hitting a storm. Yeah, we uh, we we had a work boat race and everything, and uh, uh, it started out we were. In Little Creek, and then they would go, you know, the Waterman's festivals, and we had um, that particular year they were having a race in uh, Cambridge, and we had never gone all the way down there to race, but we we went down there and uh, we won the race, and on the way back, the shift lever come apart, shorted out the wires on the boat, and it was the worst time, and the wind was blow it. They clocked the winds at, at Tillman Island at uh, 93 mile an hour. And uh, we had no floor in the boat, no window in the cabin at all because we took the window out so we could, you know, the air would blow through so we'd be faster. And we had Ted Lee with us. Um, my dad, me, and Ted Lee, and we had a hand pump. And when I say a hand pump, it's a... It's a all it was was a pitcher. It looked like a pitcher. It looked like a f big, tall funnel. And you just pump. So we would take turns pumping. And uh, it's the first time and probably in my whole entire life and maybe in his entire life that Ted Lee put a life jacket on. <laughs> you, knew you, were, I, you knew you were in trouble then, didn't you, Butterball? When I seen that happen, I said, this ain't good. <laughs> <laughs> and to be out in the middle of a chop tank at 93 mile an hour ain't good either but the good lord got us back there and we like I say we tied up at garland phillips's house and uh um it was the best and then we we ended up put, fixing the boat and going home that night but on the way home billy lender was in a boat and he was sitting just like I am right now. And he he took the he fell asleep sitting on the engine box on the way back. And Ralph Lee 
tried to get up along. He got up alongside of him and, and caught him and got alongside him and threw the buoy, threw the buoy at him and it landed right on, landed right on his arms just like this. And Billy, Billy looked around, kept looking around like what? Picked the buoy up and said, just kept looking at it. And we were all still, we were just high on him. And all we could do is laugh because <laughs> Billy, he may drink a little, but used to drink a little bit. <laughs> and the first thing he did when he set that buoy down is picked up another beer. I thought, oh, this ain't going to. But he, you know, when you've been drinking, it doesn't matter what you're doing. <laughs> So there was a story for life that, unfortunately, he he passed away a few years back. But that was one of the stories that, that um, like I say, back in '77, I think it was the day before Christmas. It was 72 degrees, and I was working in a t-shirt. And that night, that afternoon, I was trapping over here on Percy Sadler's farm. And I never seen it get so cold so fast in my life. The next day, you could have went from from Little Creek to Tillman Island and w drove a car on it. That's how fast it froze. But we, that being said, we had a lot of fun. Like I say, on the I still have the ice boat that we had. Um, we built it um, with a 16 foot sail, and. That's the most fun I ever had in my life, really. So, but it was cold. <laughs> so that's an example of some of the uh, natural challenges that these guys face. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that winter, uh, it, it, people were going out to holes in the ice. They were digging holes and cutting holes in the ice to hand tong for oysters. Um, and there's been many changes over the uh, time, the lifetime of these guys' careers. Uh, watermen have to adapt. Uh, from the days of muskratting and catching turtles to eeling and diving for oysters uh, to piloting Department of Defense boats and helping the state of Maryland study the ecosystems of the Chesapeake Bay, a watermen have always found a way to make a living. And one of those ways uh, has been to host fishing parties, uh, as many of our panelists have done. Uh, Captain Warren, will you tell the audience about uh, how you got started in the fishing party business? I've been in Queen Anne's County for 80. I've been in Queen Anne's County. I've not said before. I've been in Queen Anne's County. Been in Queen Anne's County for 89 years. So, but uh, I barely got into the fishing party business in 1953. On my return from uh, Korea in 1953, I wasn't married then, and I was staying out all night. And <laughs> I was heading home one Sunday morning at about five o'clock, and, uh, and I was okay. So I, I was going past Fisherman Den, and there were two automobiles sitting there with about 12 people in them, and they flagged me down and asked me, "Did I know a captain named Mr. Lockwood?" I said, no, I don't know him. I said, but I know where he used to live before I went into service. I said, if you follow me up there, I'll show you where he lived. I'm on my way home. <clears throat> we got to his house, and I rang the doorbell. And his, my, his wife, I guess, came to the door. And I said, we're looking for Mr. Lockwood. These people want to go fishing with him. She said, son, if you've seen Mr. Lockwood since Friday afternoon, you've seen him since I have. <laughs> 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 so, and, uh, we talked a few minutes and they said uh, we have all these people that have come down from Washington in preparation to go fishing today you know anybody who take us fishing I said I got an old crab boat uh, down the harbor I said uh, I don't have any equipment in it but if you uh, wait until I go by my dad's house and borrow a dozen life jackets I'll take you out so it was about 8.30 by the time we turned the crab baskets up for seats and put the, these cushion life jackets on it. And, and, uh, 
there was lots of fish in Queen Anne's County then, so I went out to Chester River and saw Captain Murdoch there. I just dropped my anchor and I crawled up in the cabin and they went fishing. I said, uh, when you, if they stop biting, just call me and I'll yeah. <laughs> 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 <So, I, laughs> so I, I stayed in the cabin and someone, one of them shook my feet about 12 o'clock and said, Sir, we, we've got our coolers all full now. If you want to take it, then we're ready to go. <laughs> so we got into Canton Harris. He said, uh, Son, you, you know where the fish are. He said, uh, how, much is, how much do we owe you? I think my dad was getting $4 a person to take them out then. I said, $4 each. They gave me $10 each. And that was it. I've been, I've, <laughs> you were so in I've, business, weren't you? I've been fishing ever since. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Rob, you told me some fishing stories. You got something you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah, I had, uh, when I started working, I had a mate on the boat with me. His name was Buster Elvin from Rock Hall. And Buster was probably about six foot four, great big man, his hands twice the size of mine. And, uh, used to drink a right good bit. We, he, uh, he got with the Lord and got born again, quit the drinking and, you know, carousing and was a full-time mate on my boat. Well, we're out on the boat one day. And we had a bunch of Amish on. We had about 20 Amish on the boat fishing with us. And Buster always told them, leave the fish in the water. Don't be pulling it out because when that hook comes out, it's going to get somebody. Well, this one young boy on the corner, every time he saw a fish, he saw this fish about five feet in the air and he went like this. Take it off. Put bait on. He put it back on. Pull it like this. Well, Buster said, leave the fish in the water. Buster gets over there and goes to grab the fish. The boy pulls it up. Well, the hook comes out. All of a sudden, Buster turns around to me and goes, Oh, he's got the hook right here in his face. And at this time, the boy proceeds to go with the rod, and Buster didn't move, and he went, son, give me that rod. And he took the rod, <laughs> he put it down, he grabbed the leader, and he broke the leader. And he come up in the cabin, he goes, get this out of my face. And I said, I ain't touching it. Well, I had an old pair of wire dikes. He gets in the mirror, and he takes them wire dikes, and he goes to cut it. Well, when the wire dikes went, the points crossed. He turns around to me, and he's got the wire dikes hanging out of his face with a hook, and he's bleeding. And at this point, all the people in the back of the party are having a fit. So long story short, I went ahead and took it off and put a piece of 50-pound uh, test on it and pulled the hook out of him, put some super glue and a Band-Aid, and he was fine. But that was some of the things that happened. And uh, one, one other story that, that I have, and this is not really related to fishing, um, down in Smith Island, and I used to hang with a lot of the Smith Islanders down there in the Easter with them over the years, um, there was an old old woman on the island named Miss Evans, and she called one time. She called into the uh, called into Chrisfield to the sheriff, and she said, "My, I've got this problem, sheriff." He said, "What?" She says, "Man living next door to me in the house is exposing himself," and he's like, "My land, Miss Evans, I, I'll, I'll be right there." So he gets in his boat and he flies on out to out to the Smith Island. He goes up and you know on the doors miss evans she comes out she said yes yes she said where's that man at she says right there right look right there in that window there he is well, sheriff looks over and i'm sitting there shaving in the window he goes, well, there's nothing wrong with that and he says well ma'am he's just in the window shaving she says well look again look again so he looks again and the man's sitting there shaving he said well, she's just shaving in the window she said for god's sakes we go stand on that bucket and look and you'll know what i'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> so I just put that one out there. Thank you very much. That's pretty good. <laughs> so as I mentioned, uh, Clarence has been driving the crab truck for like 40 years. And he told me a couple funny stories, little short anecdotes, basically, um, that I'd like you to share. Uh, one of them was about a, a guy who drove a crab truck to D.C., a special delivery. Oh, yeah. <laughs> George Hill had a customer down in Washington, D.C., and uh, one of the fellows that used to work for him, he used to deliver crab in Washington. And so one of the guys called back to the offer one day and talked to George Hill. Said, George said, uh, you sent me crabs today, but it didn't have no meat in them. George said, oh. I don't know what happened to him then. They had meat when they left here. 
<laughs> so, another time when I was driving for George Hill, his daughter Janae worked in the office, and it was another friend of mine that worked for George. And his name was his name is Chuck Lamon, and so he was running to, down St. Mary's County at that time to pick up crabs. And so Janae told him one day, said, uh, Chuck said, we got a new crabber down in St. Mary's County today. He said, uh, we, we want you to pick these crabs up. So he said, okay. He, she said, listen good, Chuck. said, uh, his name is Kim Uncle. He said, okay. So Chuck went and fueled the truck up, put baskets on the truck, went up off and did the paperwork. <clears throat> So Janae, the secretary, told him again, said, uh, Chuck, said, uh, don't forget to pick uh, Kim Uncle's crabs up. And she told him where he would meet him at. She, so Chuck said, okay. So he took off, went on down St. Mary's County, and they picked up all the crabs, crabs. And he went to the place where he was supposed to meet Kim Uncle. And so he waited so long, he didn't, nobody showed up. So he came on back to the office. And so when he got back to the office, the native secretary said, uh, said Chuck said, uh, Kim Uncle called here, said you can pick his crabs up. He said, uh, Janae said, I, I waited and waited, and I got tired of waiting. I came on back. Said, I, I, I didn't see Kim or his uncle. <laughs> 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 now, gr driving the crab truck wasn't always fun and games, though. You went to make a run to, uh, was it uh, Cape Charles, to buy crabs from the Coleman's? And yeah, yeah. Tell us about that, please. Richard King and I was uh, picking up crabs from, in Cape Charles, Virginia one time. We, we were picking up Bobby Lairs and Joe and, and Barry Coleman's crabs. Uh, we had three crabbers down there we were picking up from. And so one day we went down there and and there was a, a guy from Tangier and Smith Island guys. They was on track that day for more money, and they they were really upset. So they they were really saying something. So, so we uh they let us load the truck. We just had Brian, and Joe Coleman, and Bobby Lash crabs. So uh, we didn't buy wasn't buying any other crabs. So they we got loaded up and. Uh, and uh, some of the guys came up to the truck. Man, they was upset with us. They, they grabbed over the side of the truck and the rock. <laughs> we we not. They said we're not gonna let y'all leave here this afternoon. And so it was a lady down in charge of the dock. She called the police. And the, I guess by seven, eight police cars came, and they said we'll we'll see that you. God, get out of here safe. And so it was by four troopers ahead of us and by four cars in back of us. It looked like something that you see in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> and they followed us out of that marina till we got up on the highway. And they followed us a good while up the highway. And, uh, and then they turned off and went on back. So we... We felt a lot better then. <laughs> you felt a little safer, didn't you? Yeah. That's great, man. So like all of us, um, watermen have big days and bad days. Uh, there are days that they come out ahead and, and uh, days that they come out way behind. Uh, sometimes the outlook is bleaker. Uh, but it is those blue ribbon days that keep these guys going and uh, helps them through those bad times and when those bad times seem to linger. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of those big days in particular. And Joey, I wanted to ask you uh, if you would tell the story about um, unloading uh, in Cambridge. All right, this one, yeah, this one's on. Well, it was, uh, I believe it was October 1976. They had opened up from the Cambridge Bridge to, um, to the Cambridge Lighthouse. Uh, for for oystering, it had been closed for a number of years, and uh, it was a good many oysters there. 
just about every boat in the state that was Orson at the time was up there hand tonging. Well, I had my dad with me and my brother with me. Uh, and we had caught 80, 83 bushel of oysters by 10 o'clock. Uh, went to went to market and the the buyer we were selling to told us that uh, well we were getting five dollars but he says we're only going to pay you four today he says it's a glut on so we're only going to pay you four dollars per bushel of oysters so uh, we kind of pushed off from him and and we heard uh, heard that Al Woodfield from Rock Hall was paying five dollars so of course us and everybody else went to Mr. Woodfield's side and uh, rafted up and uh, waited for him to unload many boats and I wish we'd taken pictures years ago of you know 20 or 30 boats rafted up side by side and Jeff was probably there and George was probably there and many other people were there too but uh, we had to wait for we had to wait our turn and if you can imagine you know 20 boats rafted up side by side with 50 60 70 80 bushel oysters in the middle of them and, and some a few more but we had to wait for him to unload a tractor and trailer in Rock Hall come back to us and uh, we were 10 o'clock that night before we got put out. The DNR come to us and stopped us because there is a law that says that you can't put out oysters after sundown. But uh, they made an exception because of everybody being jammed up like that. But uh, we, we did that extra fight for an extra, do extra dollar a bushel. It's so. amazing, man. And uh, Captain Warren, you told me about um, one day at, down at the Narrows seeing Charles come by with a boatload of oysters. <laughs> yeah, Captain, Captain Charles. Captain Charles and I worked together for about four months that year. But I was the last day of the fishing season was Labor Day, and um, the oyster season started the next day. And I only had six fishermen out that day, and I was cleaning my boat up. And I looked, and Captain Charles went by the pier with ninety-five bushels of oysters in his boat. <laughs> and I, so I, I couldn't wait to get home that night to see him, and I called him. He said, yeah, Warren, said, oysters grew like potatoes today. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, I'd like catch you next week. I'm getting ready to go oysters, and I'm finished fishing. He said, yeah, come on, go with me, because the two fellows I had with them with me that day, they won't be here Monday because I paid them too much money. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I worked with Charles for about two and a half months, and we caught our limit every day that for the next two and a half months. And Charles, you told me about going over to the Potomac Oyster in the first time. You guys didn't know where you were at or where you were going, and uh, you hit pretty good, right? It was the first year I had the boat built, 1962 or three. And he opened the Potomac River up. Everybody in Merle went there. He, 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 uh, Boy was talking about the boats. It was at least a dozen market boats in there. And uh, we went down and had Brother Brent with me, that young fellow over there, his father. And neither one of us didn't know up and down about the Potomac River. We went in this place and come across a, there that afternoon. The sun was going down. I had the depth finder on. All of a sudden, it popped up. I said, Billy, sound, see what's here. He sounded, he said, it's oysters here. See so what we anchored up. Got, I didn't know a bit more I was out in the man in the moon. I, you could see the Potomac River Bridge. That was, I didn't know enough, enough about the Potomac River. So the next morning we got up and ate a little something, looked around. You could see boats from everywhere coming right straight to us. We must have knew something because we got there. We caught 52 boots of oysters that day. I did, and if you didn't know how to call, it wasn't how good a tongue you were there. It was how good a color you were. Because they were all close. And back then, I had no fear of an oyster being three inches. I never got called, in my, I never got arrested in my life for oysters that I called. If I got arrested for it, somebody else called them. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I called. <laughs> and, and Eddie, um, you were telling me uh, that, you know, for a couple decades, clams had pretty much fallen off around here. And then uh, three or four years ago, big boom. Uh, but you also told me uh, how when you were at Thomas Point, things kind of went the other direction. Oh, yeah, we had the biggest straight clams I've ever seen in my life. And I've been around a while. 
but you also say they come and go just as fast. We, we it, it's a lot of people in here to claim them three years. Ain't nobody seen that many. Never. When Mother Nature put them in, she she will take them away, and she takes them away in a hurry. A period of two weeks, they were gone. Being that story, Charles Bryan just told them to Potomac River. I had an uncle there. The man said, boy, I love having you talking for me. He said, but I wouldn't want you made out of steel. He said, because you were rust. I wouldn't want you out of wood because you were rot. He said, I want you made out of stainless steel. That was Uncle Bobo. <laughs> 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 and uh, Sonny, um, any uh, you guys, Butterball, Captain Warren, uh, Rob, any big days that you'd like to share with the audience? Any stories come to mind uh, in those regards? Eddie? Well, I've been around a little while. I was I was not a show water oysterman much. We used to work on the hills in Hog Bay. And, Different places. We didn't have depth finders like Mr. Bryan did. We got a sound <laughs> pool. But, but we, I worked, my tongs were 30 foot, six inches long. They were, a, I worked with a man named George Waters. He had arms on him where he had cut his t shirt, to get the damn sleeves on. But he was a good tonger. I never was in a boat that I didn't worry about the man was going to beat me because I could catch some oysters. Many a day we've caught 75, 80 bushel. But the big problem is, I well, you people know it all. Oh, these oysters have to be taken out of that boot. And it's a half a bushel tub. And you, if you got 60 bushel, that's 120 tubs that you have to dump, fill and dump. First, the packer has to make sure that you've got a good, good uh, level tub. Because if you don't, he'll raise hell. So fill that tub up. So. You know, then you got to put them in a wheel bar, six tubs in a wheel bar, which is three bushel. Then you run them into the house. You hope you had somebody there on the pier, to give them a couple of hours to, you know, run the oysters in the house. My father-in-law, uh, Mr. Alec, he, I was oyster for him, and Joe Coleman was working with me. We had Leroy Brown. You've heard that song, like Bad, Bad Leroy Brown. Well, he was. He was a shoe salesman plus. Plus a drunk, but anyway, <laughs> but anyway, uh, we would we would go, and he he could really go. I mean, he he had oysters flying. Didn't say they were all you know legal size or they were broken up or anything. But Mr. Alex said one day, he said, "You catch more damn oysters in a day than my chuckers can shuck." He said, "What the hell are you doing?" But we were lucky because we worked long tongs. And and uh, it it's a knack to work in long tongs. I mean, it's no, you didn't have to worry about sleeping at night. Your arms went to sleep. I remember when I got married, my fork fell out of my hand when I was eating supper. And Betty said, "What's wrong with your hands?" I said, "They're asleep." But you're gripping so hard with these on these tongs. You're gripping, catching them, and you're gripping, pulling it up. You're gripping it, putting it on the comb board. These damn tongs weighed 54 pounds with nothing in them. Then you put a half a bushel of oysters and shells and stuff in these things. They were heavy. And Mr. Jim Cocky up Stevensville, where Bobby Aaron now has a shop, is where uh, I had them made. Before that, I had 29s. But I didn't like bending over. So I told him to make them 30. So he made them 30 foot 6 inches. And they spliced them. Spliced the tops of them. I would Nobody knows what splicing is today, but they spliced the tops of them. And through the years, I've removed that splice twice. He re-spliced them twice to get them, give them my tongs. But they were, I mean, it was another world out there. You people just are wonderful to listen to these stories, but there are some stories. There are some characters. <laughs> we had, I had one that come down from Baltimore, was a neighbor of mine when he was younger. The name Wes Thompson, and I guess I guess a lot of you people know Wes Thompson. Well, I was oyster and I had my brother calling for me, and I was doing good. I was catching 40, 45, 50 bushel a day. Wes said, "Can I go 
working with you. He had went to Baltimore to learn a trade of laying brick, but the business the economy got bad, so he come back home. So here come Wesley, rapping on the door, said, hey, Sonny, I haven't seen you in a long while. I guess it's been 10 years. I said, what's wrong? He said, I want to go oyster with you. Somebody told me that you that Johnny calling for you. I said, yeah. I said, all right, I'll take you. So I carried him down center field, and I gave him a pair of 30s, another pair of tongs I had. And 10 o'clock, he was still working on the first board, calling Johnny off. He said, I'm so goddamn tired, I don't know what to do. <laughs> so I think I give him 45 hours that afternoon. He spooks right up. He said, it's funny what him green stuff does to you. <laughs> so we stopped and got a pint of liquor. And I think he drank about four-fifths of it going down the road. So, But it, it was a lot of fun. When he come home, he was, he did, it was after the Second World War. It was so funny. We fought that war from England right straight through until he come back home. Every day, there was more stories. That was, I mean, it made you laugh all the time. Then Joe Lewis started working with us. He was, uh, Wes used to call him my monkey face cousin. <laughs> That's Brent's father. <laughs> Am I wrong, Brent? That's right, man. That's right. So we, had a, we worked hard, but we really had a good time. If anybody knows Wes Thompson, you know what I mean. Uh, uh. He was a great man. Three of my friends were alcoholics. Ralph Hoyt, T.D. Jones, and Wes Thompson, and they all quit at the same time. Wes told me later, he said, the only thing bad about alcohol, you got to go to the damn meetings. <laughs> he said, I don't have time for all that. Hey, Captain Warren, uh, since Sonny mentioned Teeny Jones, didn't Teeny tell you something out one day? Uh, one Christmas, one cold Christmas? With, uh, well, after Thanksgiving, almost up to Christmas, and uh, it was a real cold day working over in Crab Alley, and icicles were hanging from the culling board right down to the water. And he said, Warren, said, uh, let's go home. He said, what difference does it make whether you starve to death or you freeze to death? <laughs> you still... <laughs> but, and as, as Wesley was saying, as Captain Sonny was saying about uh, Wes Thompson, West, I worked with him one summer. We worked uh, laying brick, and I was carrying the... And uh, Mr. Herman Thompson owned this, the company that was building and. and uh, Wesley, he had to go meet with some contractors to bring in some more supplies, and then he told his brother Walton to keep us all working. As soon as Captain Herman left, uh, Walton gave everybody some extra work to do. Wes told him, said, Wes, you sound like General Eisenhower when he invaded France. Give him <laughs> He's giving so many orders around here. This <laughs> hey, Warren, before you give that up, I also wanted to ask you, you told me about um, Richard King. And I saw some of these guys here laugh when you said that name. And um, you told me a story about uh, shoveling oysters in the snow. Well, I think every, all the watermen here know Richard King. He worked with Charles Bryan for two years. But he would, if he made $300 in three days, he spent it all, you know. But, and it came about three days before Christmas. And he said he hadn't done any Christmas shopping. He said, let's go out tomorrow. I said, suppose the snow. But uh, we went out, and we did pretty good that day when we came in. We sold them to a, a boat buying in the Kenton Harris Channel. He said, uh, Warren, you worked hard today. Let me shovel them out. And he was almost getting a bush, bushel on two shovels full. So and he, we put this 75 bushel out to this boat. And I said, go up and get the money from the captain. He went up on deck of the boat and got this money from the captain. And the guy says, I, I need one more day here to load this boat before I take it back to Annapolis. He says, I'd like to have your oysters tomorrow if, if you follow the work. He said, but that fellow that was shoveling before you, he was kind of slow. He said, I'd like to have you help shovel my Richard said, don't worry about him. He's just an old boy I picked up on shore this morning. I won't even have him with me tomorrow. <laughs> 
at Butterball, you've got the mic there. So well, let me ask you about um, Chester Jones. You told me a story about Gumps. Oh, my goodness. Well, when I was a kid, I, I stayed at my grandmother's house, and Chester would come over to the window and knock on the window at the bedroom door or at the, at the outside window. And he said, you want to go call him Krabs because his collar didn't show up. And then I... Then I ended up working with him most of the summer, and uh, we he went down Hulligan Snooze, and uh, this guy had laid across his line, and he went over and he hollered at him, told him get it up. I'm not in those many words, but <laughs> um, and the guy said something about an old man or something like that. He told me he said go up in the cab and give him my lunchbox. So I went in and got his lunchbox, and he, I set it on the engine box, and he opened that up and had a 45. <laughs> oh my goodness! He didn't shoot, he didn't shoot him, but he shot, he shot over him, and I thought myself, I stayed up in the cab and rested there. <laughs> he said, "Dad said you going with him tomorrow." I was afraid to tell Dad because I'm afraid he wouldn't let me go no more. <laughs> And since you still have the mic there, Butterball, um, you know, some of the guys on our panel happen to be characters a little bit, too. Um, and uh, as we've mentioned a couple times now, Butterball is a champion anchor thrower. But when you were a young man, you broke down in Hulligan Snooze, and yep. uh, anchor had something to do with that, right? Yep. Can you tell I, us uh, that? I worked in Snooze a lot. My dad used to work there, and then, then you know, you kind of learn the bottom that, you know, all the shell hills and all this in there, and then... This, we always work till sundown. I mean, you were allowed to work till sundown, then you come in. And uh, I was the last boat there. Wasn't nobody there but me. And uh, just about the time I pulled the anchor up to come home, motor cut out. I said, this isn't good. <laughs> so I fooled with it, and then I guess the alternator had gone up in the – I had no battery whatsoever, so I couldn't call anybody. The CB was, you know, nothing, nothing worked. So I picked up the anchor. And I got, I was up on the bow, and I started pulling myself home. <laughs> and um, how far then, was home? Then Barbell? you were pretty far. Seven and a half miles to Little Creek from from the uh, as the crow flies across Eastern Bay, right? Across Eastern Bay. And, you know, it wasn't so bad if I could stay in shoal water, but sometimes when you're in 30-something foot of water and you're throwing an anchor, you don't get much. <laughs> <laughs> but I tried to get, make each time I pulled, I would, I would get up on top of the cab and then, and I could throw it further. And then I'd jump back down and I'd pull, pull real fast and I'd go all the way back to the stern and, and I'd pull the anchor up. After it was, as it came by me, so I didn't really have, no, I didn't lose nothing. So I'd almost let it stop again, and then I'd pull it again. And two and a half hours from from uh, Hulligan's News to Little Creek, and and nobody, when I got there, there was nobody there, like, <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> yeah, I guess they just thought I was coming home tomorrow. <laughs> But 15 years later, you were throwing anchors in contests. So. Yeah, and then, then <laughs> that started. I, you yeah. know, I, number one, we didn't like getting beat. No, Thompson's, most of them, you know, they wanted to be the best boat builders. And they wanted to do, you know. And So I tell us about it, Rock Hall, Butterball, when you were over throwing we, a bucket we, Rock Hall. I was in Rock Hall one day, and this uh, we were throwing the anchor, and – um. There was a sailboat getting ready to come across the channel. There's channels real close to where we had the contest, and there was a sailboat coming through. And uh, the guy said, you can go ahead and throw. And I said, no, sir, I can't throw right now. I said, I got to wait for this boat to go by. He, said, he looked at me and laughed. He said, you can throw it. go ahead and throw it. I said, no, I'm going to wait. So I waited, and I threw the 15-foot pass where the boat went through. He <laughs> says, I sure am glad you, you did <laughs> You didn't throw it when you did. <laughs> so. And what about the last time you threw Butterball? 
in St. Michael's? Is I that was right? in St. Michael's a few years back. They had, the, I think it was the first year they had the uh, men from the Deadly Sketch. And my wife had just got out of the hospital from a long bout that we had. And that was our first first evening out. And I said, well, why don't we go down here? We went down to the see the guys, the Deadly Sketch. And I ended up throwing the anchor again. I didn't even know that was going to be there, but they said, you got to do it. I said, okay. So I went there, and I said, here it goes. <laughs> How'd it go? I ain't never lost yet. <laughs> uh, that's you know, ni 19 years of throwing the anchor and not lost. I don't know anybody with any baseball, football, anything. I'm so I'm so proud, but I'm I'm so good, so honored to be. It's humbled, humbled. I don't. I have. I have. I'm without words. I mean, really, everybody that's been by my side, not just with this, but when my wife got sick and all, and and everybody just came and helped us, and I can't even. Words can't describe how appreciative we are for the things that you all have done, and I'm glad to be who I am. Well, that really gives you a sense of community. Yeah, I wanna I wanna say something about Butterball. We uh, I would probably think it was probably about 12, 15 years ago I started throwing against Butterball in the competition. He said, "You'll never beat me. You'll never beat me." And it always went one and two. He was one, I was two. Well, we were down that talking about that St. Michael's one time. Butterball gets up there. Of course, he, he went first, and I think he threw like 72 or 73 feet. I got up there, and I was a little bit better shape than I am now. And I said, huh, that weren't nothing. I got up there, I threw 74 feet, and everybody goes through, and Butterball never said a word, never said nothing. Comes up there, and they used to take the – line and we tied it on the pole well we tied it on the pole butterball says <clears throat> hey do this to you buddy and i go good luck well the pole was tied to a bushel basket which was tied to the line butterball got up there and turned to me and goes you got to get mean he threw that anchor when it was done the line was straight out the basket was about five feet from the pole and the line from the pole to the basket looked like a banjo cord 82 feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, that was down to Tillman. That was down to Tillman. But, but, uh, <laughs> and when we used to get in these competitions, we, we were there, and it, it's all technique. And I learned, I learned from Butterball. He was a master. Well, these. Big guys would get in there, these bodybuilders. Man, they had the big arms and the little tiny waist, and they'd growl and grunt at us like this. We were sitting back here, he's drinking a beer, and I'm drinking a soda going, watch this idiot. <laughs> this guy gets up, he's got arms big as an oak tree. He goes, and he throws the anchor 30 feet. <laughs> Butterball gets up, says, watch this, one-handed, 40 feet. <laughs> but we, we always had fun, and I, I, wish it would, I wish it would come back. We, have, we still do have it, and I uh, MC down at Tillman Island every year for the anchor toss, but we miss having Butterball there because I'll tell you, the, the most you're going to see now is 60, 50 feet. You don't see those spectacular tosses like this man done. He's a, he's a legend. That's so. awesome. Sonny, did you I have like, something you want to share? I'd like to tell you about Chester Jones. If you people don't know Chester Jones, but he was a character in Dominion. He lived down there in a house. He had electricity. I oyster with him a few days. My uncle, Uncle R. Stevens, was a three-mast schooner or ram. Captain, he sailed from Baltimore to North Carolina. He would take coal down and bring lumber back to Baltimore. So a couple of days there, Uncle Larry was sick. So I went down to see Chester because Chester worked by himself, like you said, down snooze. 
So he said, yeah, I'll call the doctor. But there you go. Chester Jones had problems because he lived in Burma Road. That's what we called it. Him and his neighbors fought like you wouldn't believe. One man hit another one with an oar. There was something going on down there. So Chester got mad with the electric company. Now this is hard to believe. And he 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 had an anchor home threw that anchor over top of the wires and pulled the damn wires down because he didn't want to pay his electric bill. He said it was too damn high. You know, probably four or five hours, you know. But he was mad with the electric company. I said, man, you got electrocuted. He said, hell, I've been better off dead and paying that damn electric company. <laughs> so he was a character. But anyway, I thought I'd just hit you with that story. That's a good one. Okay, well, we'll do that. Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Being, being a charter captain, uh, you know, kind of see Cap Montreux in the back there, and you know, and, and everybody else. You know, we get asked, you know, we get asked a lot of questions all the time, and some of them are very intelligent questions, like, uh, "What bridge is that?" They just come across it five minutes ago. It's the Bay Bridge. <laughs> Actually, I had one group one day. We trolled through the bridge, turned the boat, started pointing south, and they go, what bridge is that? I'm like, that's the one we just trolled through five minutes ago. <laughs> I haven't built any more out here yet, but N another another good question is a uh, guy goes, uh, Cap, um, when this boat needs fuel, do you put it on a trailer and take it up the road to the gas station? <laughs> I'm like, no, uh, they have a gas pump at the marina. <laughs> And one thing that the watermen are known for is playing pranks on each other. And uh, so Eddie had a prank uh, that he wanted to tell us about. Maybe you guys will think of one that uh, this will remind you of one as well. Well, one of my old buddies, we were down part of the island. We were grudging, cleaning them shells up. Called me and said, hey, Cap, you got any suntan lotion? I said, man, I got a brand new tube. He said, can I get some? I said, yeah. I said, but I ain't giving you my tube. I said, you come over, I'll give you a big squirt in your hand. He said, all right. So he come up alongside of me. I give him a big old squirt. Man, he rubbed his hands together. And the boy was helping me. He was laying in the floor of my boat laughing so hard. He, he was about to die. <laughs> old Ronnie Smith, he... Rubbed it all over his face and all over his head. As he walked up to the cabin, said, face start tightening up. I give him the preparation H. <laughs> 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 yeah, so when he got home, his wife said, what happened to you, Day Ron? I said, you look part of your sugar. <laughs> <laughs> How about you guys? Any any pranks or anything like that come to mind? Clarence, <laughs> Clarence got something. <laughs> I remember when I worked with George Hill back in those days. Of, right after Thanksgiving, we used to run down to Carolina to pick up crabs, but now they the freight truck brings them up. And uh, we would run down to the Carolinas a couple of times a week. And uh, this got driver from South Carolina, he would meet me in North Carolina around midnight. And so uh, they had a new driver one night, and uh, I could tell he didn't know anything about crabs. So uh, I backed my truck up to him, and we, I had a buddy that used to drive with me. His name was Wayne. So... I backed the truck up to his truck to offload, uh, offload onto the from his truck to my truck, and so my but those crabs came in those crates. It was about 
two books to, to a crate that weighed by between 80 and 90 pounds. And so my brother, he dropped the side of his crate one night. <laughs> and, the, and the guy, and the, when they dropped his side of the crate, that made, made them crabs come alive. <laughs> the guy, the, the driver, he didn't know anything about crabs. So when them crabs start coming alive, <laughs> he jumped out the back of the truck. He said, man, you, you done woke them crabs up. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, man. How about the guys? Anything? Any come thing come to mind? Any gentlemen want to share? Captain Warren, you got one. One of the fish, one of the fishermen on my boat was talking about his buddy passing. They were longshoremen from Baltimore. He's and he was kind of a wicked fellow. He said, "You know, so and so died. Somebody should go to his viewing." and say a word, a good word about him. He said, what can you say good about him? There's nothing in the world you can say good about him. <laughs> so he went to his uh, viewing that Saturday, then he came back and told him, I went, he said, what could you say good about him? He said, well, I did the best I could. He said, I could carry that, bar, that bird as far as the River Jordan, and I left him there. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, whoever he belongs to, come and get him. <laughs> hey, Warren, while you still have that, um, you told me about Richard King borrowing $25 from Sonny, I think, didn't you? A couple times. <laughs> Sonny said, I saw him pass him, one, uh, Richard pass him one day driving one of George Hill's trucks, and, and he had to stop and look at him. He said, the old Richard's going to pay me my money. Richard jumps out of George's truck, goes back. Captain Sonny, I owe you $25. Could you loan me 25 more? And that way I'll owe you 50. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, you got any of any, uh, these Richard King stories you want to share or any of these guys come to mind? I was working by, my, I was working by myself in my little boat. I've still had the big boat rigged up for fishing party. That man right there, Warren Butler, shoved King off on me. But King, King was a good man as long as he was in the boat. Just as good as you want. But when he got ashore, you might not see him for a week. And uh, he um, was work, working for Billy Harris. And Billy Harris, this was in the spring. Bill Harris, Billy didn't want nothing but Pine and porn oysters, round single oysters. So King went up there with me, man. He was a fussing. So we worked for about half a day, and King said, Let's go up here get put a few in there with him. I didn't want him to do it, but I did it. We went up there, and we ended up on about 60 bush oysters. We were putting the oysters out. And I told King, I said, You can't fool Bill Harris. You fool some of these people, but you can't fool him. We got the horses, most of them out, and here come Billy. He cost us. He cost me. They got told you that you weren't a bond anymore. Get away from the work. So we went back over. By the, I was tying in the, over to, to uh, Swords Marina. And, and the next day was supposed to be Saturday. It's supposed to be a bad, bad day. So we throwed, had about 15, 18 booster left. And I threw them right alongside the boat. Old King, he come down about a week or so later, been on a big drunk. He come down and said, this gets on them horses. I said, I've caught them every day by myself and sold every one of them. He didn't think much of that. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a good man in the boat. But after, he, you, could, you could not depend on him. I don't know whether you people in here realize what went on in Kenton, Arizona. It was, without a doubt, the most fascinating place to grow up in. There was about 12 packing houses, I think. Now there's one. There was at least 900 to 1,000 people living in shanties on the marsh. The oyster packer used to walk around with a roll about that big around money because everybody got paid in cash. And it was 
I mean, a couple of us been, had been hit in the head. Billy Harris got hit in the head. I think Harvey Ruth got hit in the head. Herman's house was, was vandalized. Herman Thompson, you know, the bill where uh, the development is now. But it was it was a trying time. You take about, well, the Grayson Billers, we used to call them, I don't know, they come in early. <laughs> but we they stay, I early. mean, we always come in late. You know, working late, all of us, Billy Shells, George Waters, New Waters, we were late. And most of the time, the, the, the docks were a little bit clear. But the, uh, Mr. Carroll, let's see, it was Carroll Pearson and Harry Bryan were the oyster inspectors. Carroll Pearson was on the north side, and Harry Bryan was on the south side. And you better damn sight have them right, because they would tell you, don't come in here with that tomorrow. But it was a trying time. You got to remember, we had boats that had no clutches. They had no switches off and on. At two wires, they hooked together. We had no no compasses. If we had a compass that sat on top of the engine box, which is a no-no, you know, and you, you used it because you wondered where in the hell you were going. But... I'll never forget one day we was going down Eastern Bay and it started snowing. And then all this ice had filed up over to the eastern because the wind had been up to the western. George and I got down center field and we got tonguing. And the snow and kept getting harder and harder and harder. I said, George, we better get the hell out of here. We ain't going to get home. So we started home. Parsons Island was blanked out. We couldn't see it. But we saw the shoal water in Parsons Island Nares. We found the wharf over there that Joe Usselton used to use to go back and forth to Parsons Island to take his family to school every day. But anyway, we went in there and we were froze up for two weeks. So we get the boat out. We had to back her all the way up to fast, almost up to the Nares, backing up. We take our boots, we had our boots on, we'd keep breaking ice to get up there. But that ice all moved over and closed us right in. I thought that day it was never gonna end. But I just thought it was nice. And when you ride by the Kenton Harris now, just think of probably 150 boats traversing through that channel, tongs hanging over the stern, people the people coming into the wharf, cutting their motors out. Damn boat sliding ahead, coming back. It was, it was, I mean, it was, it, you wondered how they navigated, how in the hell they run these boats. Now they got all these fancy things, fancy clutches. You know, it's fascinating. But when you grew up in that era, you know, it was another era altogether. It's not there no more, never will be there. And you talk about catching clams. I was in Potomac River. I was digging clams for two dollars and a half a bushel. It cost a twenty-five cents a bushel to haul them north. That I got two dollars a quarter, and they limited us to forty bushel three days a week. We used to leave here at three o'clock in the morning, drive to Potomac River, clam on the western side. Well, be on the south side of Potomac River. We weren't allowed to work a clam on the, the other side, so. It, it, it's been a trying time, and I appreciate all you people showing up, coming out here, and listening to our woos. <laughs> but, but it was great, and I'm glad I grew up in that time. And I tell my sons, I've got three sons and seven grandsons. And I'm glad none of them have to oyster. They're all dedicated. They want, they want to retire after 28 years or 30 years. So they all got jobs in the park companies and this kind of thing, but it's great. But I appreciate them. I appreciate you people that visit my establishment because it was a long, hard row. So thank you, and thank you for listening to us. How about you guys? Uh, Eddie, you were, you had to hear something like that. Yeah, went to Deals Island one time. I didn't think I'd ever get there like took 10 and a half hours. When I finally got there, old guy standing named Eldridge Frass looked at me. He said, how'd you trip, boy? I said, it was pretty good. I said, but I didn't think I'd ever get here. He said, I done run more sites, 
water out of my sock that you done sailed over. I said, yeah, but I done pumped the Chesapeake Bay out this boat three times. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> How about it, Joey or Butterball? Got Marn, you guys got anything you want to share in those regards? Yeah, well, th things you don't think about uh, now, but looking back, uh, there was a time uh, we were all tied in uh, Sandy Point because uh, the, the bay froze up and we were clamming over there. And then it stayed open on that western side. So we were clamming out of Sandy Point. But we got run in that morning because the heavy white ice from up the bay and it broke up a little bit and moved down the bay. Well, my transmission tour up on the boat, and I had my dad with me, my son with me, Joey, who's right there, and, and my daughter with me, and a little uh, friend of theirs was also with us. Uh, the, the wind come out of the south and flood tide pushed some of that ice up the bay. So here I am limping across the bay with no reverse in any one chunk of ice could have put me to the bottom. You know, I had three generations on the boat with me. You don't, you don't think about things at the time like that, but uh, looking back, that was, things could have turned real bad real quick there because nobody could have got to us. But uh, thank, thank Lord that everything worked out good and we all felt safe at the time. But just looking back, that's some of the things that we do. In our, in our daily struggles to make a living for our families that you know we just don't look back you just don't realize it while you have the mic joey um you told me a story about uh, one of the things these guys have to do out on the water is communicate with each other and you told me a story about your dad and uh buckets they were using buckets now, to communicate. No, this this was this we were fishing parties and this was before right before the time of radios well signals that uh, my dad had worked out with another gentleman another captain was put a basket up on top of your canopy. You know, if you're on the fish, you put a basket up. Well, my dad, he, he didn't think about it. He just finished the bushel of clams up and he sets a basket up on the canopy. Well, next thing he knows, here comes his buddy looking for where, where are the fish? You know, you, you give me the signal, you put the basket up there, but uh, look, well, I'm sorry, I forgot, but that was just, you know, it's not, it's no cell phones, no texting, no, no nothing. Then it was just, but that was the signal. And Dad, give the wrong one out. It got the signal switched. It got the signal crossed. <laughs> and while we're talking about communication, Rob, will you share the stories um, about working down the bay with those guys who talk funny? <laughs> uh, they're they're good-hearted people, the boys from down to Smith Island. But the thing is, they have a lot of Welsh and Gaelic in their tongue, but they talk backwards a lot of times. And for instance, up here, you're going to work. Someone will say, man, I'm not going out. It's blowing a gale. Down there, when you ask them, you going to work? Hey, don't you think it's not blowing a hurricane out there this morning? And you, they're asking a the question. Well, for years, and what Sonny has hit on and everything, and when we all used to work together, Rock Hall, where I oystered out of for over 30 years, we had a very large contingency of Smith Islanders and from Deal and Fairmount there, probably 20 to 30 head. And, you know, they all tied up at the docks, and they would come up here in Oyster until Christmas. And then they'd go back down to Smith Island and finish off season down there. <clears throat> well, when we would leave the creek in the morning, I used to hang with the, a lot of the guys from Smith Island because I just love their stories. I mean, just, they, you know, they're on the bay all the time, and there's a lot of these guys were in their 60s and 70s when I was in 20, 25, 26 years old. Well, towards the end of when they stopped coming up, we were leaving the creek one morning, and this one boy said, uh, said, why do you guys always go so slow when you go out? And they say, we're soft crabbing. They go, this isn't the time of year to soft crab. They said, no, my, but when you soft crab, you don't go fast. <laughs> so they're taking their time getting out. Well, two guys were behind us one morning, and they're going back and forth on the radio. One says to the other, he says, ma, I didn't see you up at the restaurant for dinner last night, didn't they? And the other boy said, no, no, no. I, I just walked on up shore stop and got me some potato chips. And he said, uh, well, how were they? Were they good? He goes, man, I, they're about the hottest potato chip I ever done had in my life. He goes, what's it? Don't you think they didn't burn a hole clear in my mouth? And he goes, what kind of potato chips were they? He says, I don't know. Those, those, those Japanese have one heck of a hot potato chip. He goes, what were they? He said, they were Japalinas. <laughs> Jalapenos. <laughs> 
and they just and and some of the other stuff and and uh, Joey was talking about communication. One year we were down working below the bridge, and we had a boy from Smith Isle, and I was I was probably 17, 18 years old, and we're drifting, and he's backing up. Well, we would drift past him, and he'd back up. And my captain would turn to him, and he would take his hands, and he would put his hands up like this. And the guy next to him, the guy from Smith Island, would go, I said, what's that? Well, I ask him how he's doing, and when he goes like this, he says, not worth nothing. I said, okay. The next drift, we go by, and he goes, captain goes to him again. He puts his hands up. He goes, and he goes, and I said, now what's that? And he goes, rolling the oysters right up ahead of you. I said, okay, that works good. And this went on all day. It was hand signals and all this. Finally, there was one at the end of the day when he walked by, and it, the cap, we went past, and the cap never said nothing to him. The boy from Smith Island does this. I said, now what is that? The oyster's behind us? He says, no, his hands are frozen. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, good, it's good working with guys on the bay, and, 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 it's, and I do want to uh, amplify what Sonny said. It's good having all you people here tonight because um, the organization that I – represent the fight that we have and we work we've worked hard with Queen Anne's we've worked hard with Kent and Talbot counties in keeping these guys working through the regulation and what, what you have to understand with these guys the smallest one of the smallest industries in the state is the heaviest regulated it would be just like if you have a job going to work at your job where you're stopped by the police three or four times a day they want to search your vehicle three or four times a day. They come into work and want to talk to you. Everything move you make, they tell you where you can go, how you can go, when you can go, what you can go, who you can go with. And these guys have to work on this every single day. And the thing we take pride in is when you look at that state seal of Maryland, you see two things on that state seal. You see a farmer and you see a commercial waterman. I don't see someone that is ruining the state and you never see anybody on there pulling a boat in a trailer and that's what you know the heritage that these guys have it's the most important thing that we have to work with and the organization that i chair delmarva fisheries that's what we do we we make sure that these guys and it's a hard fight it's a real hard fight in what we do and a lot of guys brought some stuff here but if you guys you know you guys ever want to go on the website we, our website is delmarvafisheries.com. See what we do. If you'd like to join, we'd love you to join because we do these. These guys need the help to keep going what they are. And I want to thank you very much for coming today. You know, that's a really important point to make. Um, these guys are a, a living embodiment of the, her the cultural heritage uh, and history here on the Eastern Shore. Um, the, when most of these guys came up, working on the water was a viable option for a lot of young men here on the shore, and it's just not that anymore. Um, so I think it's important culturally for us to spend some time with these guys. And, and the last thing before we take questions, um, uh, there's been a lot of changes over the years uh, that these guys have seen, and they've mentioned some of them tonight. Um, Charles, you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, like the stakes and uh, the ways of Kenton Arrows has changed, Steve. Yeah, did you want to touch on that? There's a microphone right there behind you. Uh, you were talking about like the stakes and how things have changed here. Oh, stakes. Stakes, stakes. And not the meat either. Not, not pounds, but stakes. Put, put down by hand. And it was a lot, I couldn't do it now. But ever crick. On Kent Island, Graysonville area, Winchester Creek, Ever Creek had boats into it. And they did that because after the war, my father was in the service during the war, and after he'd come home, you couldn't buy a boat, you couldn't buy a car, and most of them didn't have any money to start with. But anyway, everybody put down the boats close to home so they didn't have far to walk. Until it got winter, then they all went to Wells Cove. But there was there were all cricks around had myself, I, I've tied boats up in Reeds Creek, Tillman Creek, Queenstown Creek, Winchester Creek, Jackson's Creek, Wells Cove in Kenton Irons, Marsha Creek, 
Cabin Creek, Wife Ferry, and, and Bryantown Landing. And then I taught for a while up to uh, by the bridge. And one year when I was ill, I taught up to uh, the landing that's in Tarbert County, up to Hiddle Wide River. I can't think of the name. Why Landing is called. So it just shows you how people have changed, how things have changed. Now everybody wants to get in the marina. And before we all die, we might go back to introduce. <laughs> that's what it is, Sonny. <laughs> but you had to have a skiff to get out to your boat. My father built a lot of skiffs, a lot of skiffs. And some of the, it's a wonder some of them, this skiff that got down to the Nairs, where the th two men are up in the front paddling, that ain't the way we paddle, folks. That, 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 whoever thought that up was 110% wrong. You, you, you paddled the boat, a lot of times we rode it out there, but they tied it. Got in the back of one was in the back, one was in the front. The one in the in the back could more or less steer the boat. What are we getting at? It, it, it was not like that. Like one down the narrows. Well, what about the land of, of the lay of the land? Uh, Kent Narrows looks different than it used to, too, right? The points of land, and there was an island at Ferry Point Island, and well, I got a, guys... over over Bella Benton's. I got a, a map there that I got from a man years ago, and it was approximately eighteen. 60. And you can look at that map and you can see that things have really changed. Mr. Stevens, who lived in Dominion, told me he lived on Popperon, not Popperon, but Botkin around 1900, and it was 47 acres. And now it's gone, completely gone. Parkinson's Island's getting ready to go, and uh, the little island. Well, they're all gone. All the, it's, it's all kinds of little islands. Fair poor and island, it's been gone. But there's not a whole lot you can do to save them, really. It's, the Lord put them there and he's taking them away. So this is a good time to take some questions. Troy Wilkins, um, are you around, Troy? Uh, Troy's going to be out in the audience. Uh, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to take questions from you all, but we'd also like to hear some stories. So if somebody in the audience, George, if you have more stories, any of you guys out there who would like to share, um, please uh, take this opportunity to ask questions and share your stories. Anybody got any questions? Troy? Oh, I'm sorry. Before you guys do that, let me just say that uh, Troy uh, bought his first boat when he was 14 years old, four-speed, four-cylinder, no reverse. Um, now he's the president of the Queen Anne's County Watermen's Association, and he advocates for a watermen's concerns in Annapolis and all over this state. Troy is uh, one of the best representatives that these guys have, so let's a little round of applause for Troy. And now you can take questions. Uh, I think all, all of us had a question for Eddie. We wanted to know, did he double dip? <laughs> did he double dip with that uh, sun, suntan lotion? <laughs> it's a rumor going around. I don't know. <laughs> it's really good for mosquito bites. Preparation H's? There you go. See, we've learned something tonight. Good for mosquito bites. Anybody else? <laughs> That was your, no, that's not. Yeah, that wasn't my question. I'm I'm Trisha. I grew up on Crab Alley Bay. My dad moved us here in 1963 so that we could grow up on tide water. Um, and my question is, because I've been exposed to watermen over the years, and um, many people here may remember my dad. He fixed clocks for many years. Um, my question is, what's the most unusual thing that ever came into your boat without your permission? Oh. <laughs> Some of my help. <laughs> Anybody got any stories about anything like that? Or you tied to a stake, you didn't have to worry about rats. Rats in a way. So rats would get on the boat. I come out of Queen Anne County one time. I threw it in there, and the water run back to the stern. I looked. I thought I was on the movie Willard. Oh. Yeah. I ain't never seen that many rats run off a boat in my life. Wow. I was getting ready to go back to bow myself. 
I had a coon. I had a coon get me in the cab. And he come, he run to the door. I couldn't get the door to the door because he was sitting there growling at me. I had to go out through the hatch. Good thing I had a hatch. Out through the roof. And I got my fry bar. And I told him, oh, buddy, it's either me or you. One of us going to get out of this cab. <laughs> he lost, I think. That's hilarious. Anybody else got any other stories from Captain Warren? Some, some of the uh, fishermen tell quite a number of stories. There was a couple of ladies on one Saturday morning. She said, I understand your son finished high school last year. I said, uh, what did he do? She said, oh, he moved on up north there, and he found him a nice job in Elephant, New York, and he's doing very fine. She said, I've never heard of Elephant, New York. I've heard of Buffalo. She said, well, maybe that's what she said. She, I know she said one of those big animals. <laughs> now we uh, one year we were fishing down in Eastern Bay and I had um, probably some of these guys know the boy used to meet with me down when I was down at Tillman Mike Lipsky, old Lipper yeah, I had old Lipper on the boat with me we're out early in the morning it's about 5 o'clock and we're up there in Eastern Bay right off K2 and we're trolling, we're out there commercial fishing. It's dead quiet. My boat's a pretty quiet boat, and I'm sitting right on the washboards, and Lipper's next to me, and he's drinking his coffee. And all of a sudden, about two feet from us, we hear this, and scared the butt Jesus out of both of us. Well, it was a mother dolphin and her young one. And uh, they stayed right by the whole boat the whole time, and Lipper's going, God, what's happening if we catch one of these things? I said, we're going to have a hell of a fight. That's what we're going to have. <laughs> Well, we caught our first fish, and the first fish, when it was coming across the water, Lipper's reeling it in. He's going, I think we lost it. I said, no, here it is over here. Well, the porpoise was taking that striper and pushing it with its nose. And they stayed around the boat for about a half an hour, and then Lipper started throwing L-Ys at them like that, and they left. But was, you know, first thing sitting in the morning, all of a sudden have one right alongside the boat when that air blew. You never hear anything like yeah, that. Man. It put both of us on top of the cabin. <laughs> Are there any more questions or any stories out there that anyone would like to share? All righty. Gentlemen, any more? Oh, we have something, Troy? Here you go. Back there, my man. Marcus. Hold up, Marcus. There he comes. That's our boy, Marcus. I know. Man, I've graduated with Brent and I went to high school. First of all, let me say, it's such an honor to be in a room so many legends. I mean, all you guys over there, man, this is this is as good as it gets when you live in a small town, okay? And that is the honest God truth. But Butterball, I'm going to have to tell a story on you. <laughs> There's plenty of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was in between crabbing and oyster season one year, and Mike Gardner, is Mike Gardner in here? The privateer? Is he in here? No. Anyhow, and Mike Gardner had asked me to work for him for a little while, and I was on Mike Gardner's boat. Now, we were, we were catching razor clams. Hi, Larry and Mary. Love you guys. Um, I, was, I, was, I was picking clams for Mike Gardner, and I guess at one time, Butterball, he must have been working with you. You were hammering docks or going back and forth. At one time, you were, you, he was helping you. You were helping him, and uh, you were nailing some boards on some docks, and... Uh, you were using your left hand to nail for a while, and then you were using your right hand to nail for a while, and Mike Gardner said, Butterball, you can nail with your left hand and your right hand, and Butterball said, yeah, that's right, I'm amphibious. Amphibious. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Butterball. Love you, you, Butterball. Y'all you, are, are the prince of this room, man, I'm telling you. Marcus, that's <laughs> awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Brent. He didn't tell you about the snake. I seen him do it too, Marcus. Hey Troy, we've got a question up here. This gentleman in the red coat. Oh, oh, that is Larry Hansel. Yeah, hey Larry. I got a round of applause for this gentleman right here. As we go on. <laughs> As we go on. That's just the name. That don't mean anything. But I, I just want to say something. You touched on it a little bit about the waterman's way of life and how they. 
going through generations doing this. And just bear in mind, if you were 18 years old and you wanted to go into a business, now there's no vacation with pay. There is no money from the government to build your boat. There's a, nothing nothing to offer to you other than the place to work every day. And uh, uh, Junior Sadler said one time when they cut the, cut the uh, days on clamming down to three days for a little while, and he said, God damn, all I read in the papers, all the people's out of work, out of work. Ain't nobody got a job, and we're begging to work, and they won't let us. <laughs> but that's the only thing the government does for you, it stops you. And when they and when you think they're going to help you, they give you another way to cut your own throat. You know we couldn't catch enough hand tongue, and so now you can use patent tongs, so they could make help the watermen by killing the bars off a little more. And when that wasn't good enough, they let you hand scrape, and they gave three days to the skipjacks, and then they let you dive for oysters. And all this was killing our profit, our, our product that we were working for. So when they act like George, when they act like they're going to help you from the government, it's horse manure. <laughs> but I have to tell you a funny story. I was dealing with Francis Ford, and uh, we were using mannos. By the way, I just ate down Jerry Harris's and had mannos for a supper tonight. Never outgrow them. But we were using mannos. You all know what soft shell clams are. You've got the snout sticking out the end. And we were up the Severn River, and we pulled in the dock there, and I was mashing up clams to bait the pots with. And this lady came down with a fur on her neck, and she said, Oh, my goodness, what are they? And I said, Well, we call them mannos, ma'am. They're soft-shell clams. She said, Well, what's that thing sticking out the front? And I said, Well, we're only allowed to keep males for conservation purposes. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Good. Anybody else? Troy's got a mic. Mr. Bluey, you got anything you'd like to add? You standing there? No? Well, if there's no other questions, no other stories, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Like Sonny says, let's go eat. But I want to say some thanks real quick. I want to thank the officers and the members of the VFW for allowing us to be here tonight. This is on them. They're Absolutely. Wonderful. The, the Queen Anne's County Watermen's Association for hosting this, particularly Troy and his lovely wife, Christy, uh, who um, really uh, lead this thing along. Martha Lostrom, who's helped us with the organization of this thing tonight. Of course, I got to thank Harry Davidson and Chase yes, Springer. Indeed. Let's give a round of applause uh, for those Absolutely. Guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, don't forget to watch the documentary, Waterman. Mm -hmm. Um, on MPT this coming week. Look, uh, you know, make sure you set your DVR for that. Um, the 14 minute film is what they're going to show. And keep in mind, watermanfilm.com, you can go on that website and see how maybe you can help just expand this project into a uh, full length feature documentary. I got to thank QAC TV and George Harvey over there. Look for uh, this to be broadcast and also on the QAC TV. Um, uh, YouTube channel, it'll be on there. Uh, DJ Eddie Hit, the Hitman Eddie, for uh, being here for us tonight. Uh, Dickie Corsi, Billy Benton, and David Baxter are over here. They have all the artifacts uh, that the guys have dug up. We have authors over here, so when you have a chance before you leave tonight, maybe stop and buy a book from someone. Uh, check out my blog, easternshorebrent.com. I'll have pictures up next week of uh, this event. Uh, your bartenders, tip them even if you don't drink. And uh, how about one more round of applause for our panel? Thank you and good night. <laughs>